My name is Matthew Griffin. I'm the founder and CEO of the 311 Institute. Um, now, a lot of people call me a futurist. Uh, however, what I, one of the other things that I do is I'm a strategic advisor. Um, I typically think that if you sort of step back about 10 years ago, when you say, I'm a futurist, a lot of people will sort of believe that you've got a crystal ball. Um, it was kind of a quaint thing to do. Um, however, increasingly, more and more organizations either want a point of view on the future and or are concerned about the future simply because everything seems to be accelerating. You know, the future is increasingly starting to feel some, like something that is done to us that's rather than something that we are uh, mastering. Uh, as a consequence, uh, and when I started the 311 Institute about two to three years ago, I didn't really think that my sort of, should say, client roster basically was going to be like this. Um, I am now helping the all, a whole variety of organizations transform pretty much every single industry. Um, I work with most G20 ministers and governments. I work with four prime ministers. Uh, from an education perspective, we've now transformed the education of over a million children. Um, when we have a look at Airbus, I work with Airbus especially on the future of transportation and mobility, so that's actually things like uh, air taxis. Uh, Bentley, Bentley seem to care about helping their, uh, their, their, their customers live beyond 100 years. BMW, future mobility. If any of you are a British gas customer, I work with their board because as we start looking at the future of energy, we increasingly see energy costs dropping to zero, even though it doesn't necessarily feel like it. So at Centrica, they are starting to sell all of their generation assets, and we actually have a pathway to get down to the point where energy costs zero. Um, Deloitte, Dentons, Dentons are the world's largest law firm, so there was a, there was a sort of popular phrase a little while ago, but so that uh, the law firm and the law industry uh, hadn't really changed for 200 years. Dentons are increasingly using artificial intelligence to replace their entire paralegal there. So Dentons have 17,000 lawyers at the world's largest law firm, and technology is coming to them. Discovery, as well as organizations like Sky, Future of Content, so I will show you some synthetic content, because increasingly as we start teaching our children to move to the right brain, that's not as safe as you think. Um, I also work with the Dubai government, where we are literally building the future. So we are 3D printing skyscrapers. We are rolling out fully autonomous vehicles. We are going full dive into renewables. Um, education, from an education perspective, if you haven't gone to Dubai, I would actually encourage you to go out to companies like KHDA, uh, GEMS as well. So there's a lot of things happening over there. A Huawei and Samsung, let's see, if you use a Samsung or Huawei phone gadget device, I've helped design the next 20 years of those. So Samsung recently, it's their 50th birthday, they recently put out a Life in 2069 uh, sort of view. Uh, that's got my little fingerprints all over it. Also work with Google, for example, on the Lunar X Prize, where we're starting to put lunar uh, drones onto the lunar surface. Uh, and there's a whole bunch of other stuff. Lego, Lego is a sort of fun one. Uh, some of the conversations we have with Lego is, how do you make a conscious robot? Believe it or not, there is actually a technology that helps you create an actual, proper, conscious robot. Microsoft, future of artificial intelligence, Qualcomm, future of chips, and so on and so forth. So increasingly, I'm sort of, I feel rather confident that this sort of tag of futurist is increasingly kind of a, a, a good badge. Uh, and we are helping transform the world in a whole variety of different ways, including with the likes of T-Mobile, who have now just completed their takeover of Sprint with 100 plus million US subscribers, so I'm their US ambassador. So, one of the problems that I see that we have today, particularly from an education, bringing it back to an education perspective, is what I call the time traveler's dilemma. And this is where what I want to do at a very, very basic level is transform how you see the future and how you think about the future, both from an individual perspective, but also from a personal, from also from an organizational perspective. So if we have a look at this, if I'm a futurist and I live in the world, I live in the world of 2019, and I know for an absolute fact that we have several skill shortages, for example, around cybersecurity, we all know that there are not enough cybersecurity experts, software developers, data scientists, and everything else. So I have perfect knowledge of 2019. I get into my time-traveling device, 
I go back to the 1980s and I get hold of a variety of very important influential educators and prime ministers and people. And I say to them, I say, I have perfect knowledge of the future. But, and I understand you sort of want to see what the future is, so future of skills and jobs and all that kind of stuff. Um, I can tell you with 100% certainty that in the year 2019, we don't have enough cybersecurity experts. And they say to me, say, well, what's a cybersecurity expert? And I said, well, it's somebody basically who protects information and technology systems basically across the internet from nefarious actors who want to use it for nefarious purposes, stealing stuff. And they said, well, it sounds like a, like, sounds like a, a form of policeman. And I said, well, absolutely right. And they go, that sounds like a worthwhile job to have. That's great. I've just got one question, though. This thing that you call the internet, what is it? Yeah. At which point I said, well, I'm glad you asked. The internet is something that, over the past 20 to 30 years, basically has transformed global society, culture, and industry. It has changed absolutely everything about the planet. It's connecting 3.5 billion people to one another. At which point, during that conversation, do you think that they are going to do this? Show me the door. Because if I was in 1980 and I told you that this amazing thing called the internet was going to let us change global society and culture irrevocably, would you have believed me? If I went back to the boardrooms 10 years ago of General Motors, Ford, BMW, Volkswagen and said, oh, and said I'm dropping my clicker, uh, and said, I think that in 7 to 10 years' time, you aren't going to want to sell your cars any longer you're going to be investing hundreds of billions of dollars in electric battery technology and vehicles. And I also think that you're going, to drive, you're going to develop cars that drive themselves. At what point do you think I would have been shown the door? But we're doing that now. So as we start romping through the future, if you go to the 311.com website, you can download this. There's loads of sort of assets and bits and bobs that are just for free. Um, and the reason basically why I've sort of produced these codices, as I call them, is because there is so much change going on, it's very, very difficult to keep up. So if I asked you today, how many of you think or feel, however you want to quantify it, that today we're moving faster as a culture, society, industry, whatever it happens to be, than we were 10 years ago, how many of you think or feel that we are moving faster today than we were 10 years ago. Can I ask for hands? Yeah. Now, flipping it, because it's got to be fair, how many think it's slower today? Yeah. So if I, now, if I step forward 10 years, and I, say, and I ask you the same question, and I say, do you think in the next 10 years we are going to be moving faster or slower? Who thinks we're going to be moving faster? Okay, so that's a majority, yeah? Everyone agree? How many people think we're going to be moving slower? No one. Part of the reason for that is if I step back to the, again, say to the 1980s, 1990s, and I say, okay, from a business perspective or an individual perspective, however, um, what do you think you're going to be able to do next year with technology that you couldn't do this year? You might look at Moore's Law and you think, well, at a fundamental level, Computing chip, computer chips are going to be faster and they're going to be cheaper. So we could probably ingest and process and analyze more information. And once we can do that, we can do X, Y, and Z. Okay? Um, it's fairly straightforward. However, one of the biggest issues that all businesses and individuals have now is I say, okay, so what do you think you're going to be able to do with technology next year that you couldn't do this year? And um, I'll say, well, firstly, are you, use, are you moving your businesses to the cloud? And you sort of go, well, yeah, we, we sort of are. Um, and then I'll say, well, are you digitizing your businesses? And you say, well, yes, we've kind of got some programs going on there. And I say, fantastic. Um, so while you're doing those two big things, fully transformative uh, projects, um, are you using artificial intelligence? Uh, well, we, yes, we are a, are a bit, you know, experimenting. Um, are you doing, using blockchain? 
We've got, we're trying to get a point of view, um, and uh, it looks very interesting. All these are game-changing technologies. Um, well, what about quantum computing? Quantum computers are 100 million times more powerful than today's computing platforms. They're coming 2025. They're starting to be commercially available now at a very basic level. Um, are you doing anything there? Well, yeah, we're having a look at that. Well, hang on. What about robotics? Are you using robotics? No, we're, we're sort of trying to get our heads around that as well. What about AR and virtual reality? Well, you know, we're trying to get a point of view there, and you know, we're trying to see where we would use them and everything else. What about 5G? At this point, basically, people's brains get fried. And they say, frankly, we cannot keep up. We cannot future-proof our organizations. All this is far too much, basically, for us to ingest and digest and actually do. But if you go and have a look at sort of Gartner, MIT, 451, Forrester, and everything else, they will typically talk about these kinds of technologies. Um, one of the main issues that we have, though, is that there aren't really eight emerging technologies or eight exponential technologies. There are hundreds. If you want to tear up the rule books for every single industry on Earth, nothing left standing, you take these individual technologies and you combine them. How you combine them, I see, then... then Produce, you know, so the way that you combine them can tear down industries and create new ones. Basically, you can use them to create brand new products and services that you either have in your hands, basically you're using over the web or whatever it happens to be. 25 of these technologies are general purpose. If you think about the power of artificial intelligence that doesn't just affect one industry or one particular use case, it affects millions in every industry. There are over 25 of those. So in this little radar, um, what I try to do is simplify the future, because it's insanely complex. And one of the ways that I do this is I create these starbursts. So this starburst is, moves between 2020 and 2060. Um, the reason why I go out sort of beyond 20 years is if you are working with governments on future of education and skills, future of transportation, future of infrastructure, future of energy and everything else, you need to go further out than 20 years. From an education perspective, I always say that educators have got one of the hardest challenges on earth from this perspective. Because if you're a multinational, you might care about the next five to 10 to 20 years. But as educators, we are starting, we are trying to prepare children as well as ourselves, but we're particularly trying to prepare children for a future that starts 2035, 2040. Do you know what 2035 or 2040 will actually look like? I will show you if the answer was no. So every one of these individual technologies basically is a game changer in themselves. They can transform either one industry or multiple industries. Um, the little dots basically show when they mature, and each individual technology basically has got a total addressable market opportunity of about half a trillion dollars. These are my sort of top 180 picks, but I actually track over 400. Every year there are typically about another 50 to 60 emerging. So as I say, everything accelerates. So giving you a little bit of an example, three, and I won't go through all of them, don't worry, uh, 3D bioprinting. 3D bioprinting has now got us to the point where if you go to the NHS uh, and you need a bone transplant, a skin transplant, a cataract transplant, uh, if you need a cart, if you have problems with cartilage, they can 3D print new skin. We're also at the point where we can 3D print mini brains, we are also at the point where we can 3D print many human hearts. So if you think about just the impact of bioprinting, and this is before we get into biomanufacturing and other things, one technology, on the one hand, extends human life because you now no longer need to, and you also need, no longer need to wait for somebody else to die to get a new heart in the future. In addition to that, if in 20 years' time so you have a heart attack, there is no reason basically why the NHS couldn't say, well, look, we have two options for you. Uh, we could 3D print, using your own stem cells, we could 3D print your own human heart. It's yours, it's not a donor's, it's yours, and it's brand new. Um, but would you like us to 3D print electronics into that heart as well? So as and when it uh, detects any sort of oddness, uh, it can just kickstart itself. Would you like that? You know, tick here. Um, 3D holographic printing. So the speed of acceleration of some of these technologies, 3D holographic printing uses uh, light and gels. So if you're Adidas, you now 3D print trainers in the back of your store. The impact of that is, is, is multitude. 
So Adidas and Nike and Under Armour, uh, for example, import hundreds of millions of shoes basically from China. If you can 3D print products basically in the back of your retail store, you eliminate the need for global manufacturing. You also eliminate the need for global logistics and supply chains. You also eliminate inventory. You also improve personalization. As you improve the ability to personalize products in the back of stores, you make more money. Retail 2.0. Um, and then we have 4D printing. 4D printing, NASA are now experimenting with 3D and 4D printing, very small nanosats and eventually spacecraft in orbit. My children prepared for that. Um, bioreactors. Bioreactors, I'll show you one of those a little bit in, in a little bit. Bioreactors, the only real thing that bioreactors do, if you combine them with vertical farms, the only thing they do is solve global famine. The United Nations say that by 2050, we will have 11 billion people on the planet. Bioreactors, you put stem cells from an animal basically into a bioreactor, and you can grow a whole variety of meat. Everything from fillet steak to duck to chicken, the whole, whole nine yards. Now, it's not plant-based meat. It's not artificial meat. It's actual meat. You take a bioreactor, you put it into Timbuktu, you stick it next to a vertical farm, you use 99% less water than traditional farms on the crops, eight times, basically the, eight times uh, the, the amount of yield from a crop perspective. You can feed people in the middle of the desert, and we've bought these and we are using these. Jeff Bezos has just invested well over $300 million in the technology as well for a variety of reasons. You stick these in the middle of the desert, you convert, you can solve famine. From a UAE perspective, they import most of their food. You don't need to import food if you're actually making it in your own backyard. So now we're having an effect, having an impact basically on the global food organizations. Um, and then we've got all sorts of other things. Um, biotech, in vivo gene editing. If you have Hunter's syndrome, we did this last year. If you have Hunter's syndrome, you go into a GP and you say, I've got this condition, not really sure what it is. Um, can you tell me what it is? The UK NHS, but this was done in America, will say, what we've done is we've done some analysis and uh, we've got good news and we've got bad news. The good news is that you are going to die in 20 years' time. At which point, the patient sort of says, it doesn't sound like good news to me. Um, so if that's the good news, what's the bad news? And they go, well, the bad news is it's going to be a very slow, painful death. And they go, well, I think I'd like the good news now. Um, Using technologies, so gene editing technologies like CRISPR, um, last year we were able to put a CRISPR gene editing tool into an intravenous drip. The chap with Hunter's syndrome basically sat in a bed, got attached to the IV drip. About two hours later, got up. Uh, about two months later, basically he didn't have it because CRISPR gene editing edited out the faulty genes and edited new ones in. The same technology can be used to start curing or resolving, or limiting the impact, however we sort of want to dress it up, for over 6,000 inherited gen genetic diseases. Uh, we have smart medicines, regenerative medicines that I'll go through a little bit, neuroprosthetics. So neuroprosthetics, increasingly, we actually do have a way to download the human mind, and that's, been, that's actually been demonstrated. Uh, and if you want, just ask me. Um, we've got labs on chips that eliminate animal, that eliminate animal testing, um, there's all sorts just in there. From a computer and systems. So in 2025, really today, but in 2025, we will have a commercial, commercially available quantum computer that's 100 million times faster than anything that we have today. However, we're not talking about you know, future education. We're not talking about six years out. We are talking 20 years out. So the world of computing, basically, when you start looking that far out, basically, is very, very different Biological computing. Over in China, basically one of my customers is now on the fifth generation of biological computer. What we mean by that is you take a bacteria device, you pay, take a bacteria, you can store information in the bacteria, like movies, and play them back. With biological computing, basically we've also managed to demonstrate that you can turn a human into a computer. Uh, so you can thank a whole variety of UK organizations for that, University of Manchester and, uh, and so on and so forth. Chemical computing, we've already turned chemicals basically into computing devices. Distributed computing, DNA computing. If you have a DNA computer, a DNA computer about a quarter of the size of a test tube 
can pack in more computing power than every single computer on the planet today. And if you want to go and have a look at the blueprints and have a conversation with people, go and have a conversation with the University of Manchester again. But in addition to that, Microsoft are actually going to be rolling out DNA storage in their Azure cloud come 2020. Flexible electronics, basically IPUs speed up uh, artificial intelligence. We've got molecular computing. Molecular computing uses polymers, and the uh, United States Army and DOD want to use molecular computers by the end of 2030 so that they can collapse a hyperscale data center down to the size of the lectern from a storage and compute perspective. Um, and we already have a lot of successes there. Liquid computing. We already have liquid computer chips and liquid storage so remember, basically, with these are already emerging today. In order for these to be mature, you have to take lots of individual components, integrate them together, test them, test them again, experiment again, experiment again, and then push it forward. And eventually, we get to a commercial product that's the right price point, and it's mature enough, and the regulators let it go. Um, so these, basically, yeah, are we teaching children, basically, the concepts of biological computing? No. Out of this entire list, by the way, out of all the 400 emerging technologies that I track, in the UK, we are only talking to our children, and not all children by any stretch of the imagination, about nine of them, talking. In terms of doing, showing them the theoretical concepts, walking them through, actually helping them experiment with these things or get their hands on anything like this, it's more like three. Programming, digital stuff, artificial intelligence, blockchain doesn't make an appearance. And the connectivity side of things, 5G basically is transformative, and I'll show you that there. Uh, we also have space internet systems. Space internet systems will connect up the last 3.5 billion people on the planet. Are your children ready to go up against another 3.5 billion gig economy workers? Probably not. Plus, those workers are going to be armed. Um, from an energy perspective, again, not going to go through all these because we'll be here all day. Um, so we're moving to electric vehicles. Electric vehicles, we have lithium-ion batteries. We then start moving to polymers. Um, structural batteries are interesting because a structural battery allows you to create a car that doesn't have a lithium-ion battery. You turn the body of the car, the shell of the car, basically into the battery. It's using carbon nanotubes, which is wherever they are. So carbon nanotubes are a weirdy technology as well. Um, we've got biofuels, biobatteries, backscatter energy systems. You want a phone, basically, that doesn't have a battery in it? We've already demonstrated that with Samsung last year because we harvest the, radio the radiation in the air, basically, to charge your phone. That's very useful for the Internet of Things, by the way. Photovoltaics. Um, we have a, today, basically, most commercial solar panels are about 17% efficient. We have a path to 80% an actual path, not a funny theoretical, you know, let's uh, make up a number path, and I'll show you that. Printable batteries. Intelligence. Artificial intelligence is here by the time your children are going out into the world, say 2030, 2035. Are they ready for artificial general intelligence? AGI makes regular artificial intelligence basically look like a toy. Um, so we also have creative machines. If you are telling your children to go to the right brain thinking, creative machines are going to make you actually question that. Materials, self-healing materials, spray-on materials, graphene, basically we've got graphene basically in, that's being used to water, to purify water in single-step reactions. Uh, polymers are a really crazy one. Future of antibiotics is polymers, um, but also future of energy and electricity could also be polymers. Future of computing is also polymers. Um, as well as other things. Robotics, we've got soft robots, neuro-robotics. You know, I mentioned earlier that one of the conversations I have with Lego is how do you create a conscious robot? Increasingly, what we're actually doing is we're able to take an insect brain and merge it with an actual robot. It's a conscious robot. However you want to, uh, to, uh, however you want to play it. Um, swarm robotics, nanomachines, nanobots. Basically, I actually have a video which I haven't included in this. Um, we have videos and we have technology now that will let nanobots and nanomachines do in vivo human surgery, albeit they're still in the lab. Because can you imagine? Because you know, with all of these technologies, they're great, whatever, but at some point the regulators have got to say, yes, that's fine. At what point do you think the regulators are going to go, so okay, what you want us to do is you would like us to use nanobots to go around a human body 
uh, doing some surgery. Uh, I'll just okay that. It's fantastic. Yeah, here we go. Uh, here, have your certificate. Regulators are having to play catch up. I work with a lot of regulators, and they are starting to play catch up, and we get some things coming through faster. Security, we have Morpheus computing platforms. Um, they are unhackable. A Morpheus computing platform is a computing platform that reconfigures its hardware and reconfigures its software 50 times a millisecond. Um, we also have quantum internet, quantum communications coming through, DNA encryption. Uh, from a world of biometrics, biometrics impacts education from a whole variety of perspectives. And we just keep going around the wheel. Um, we have ways to transfer memories basically between living organisms. Basically, that's been done. You can look all this up. Um, we also have neural interfaces. I'll show you some of those things. And then we get to the more traditional emerging technologies of virtual reality, augmented reality, and so forth. However, also consider this. If you take a lot of devices, whether they're Internet of Things devices, whether they're driverless cars, doesn't matter what it happens to be, robots, machines. If you have a load of devices that are connected to the internet, connected to the cloud, and connected to artificial intelligence, do you now have a hive mind? You teach one robot something in China, and it teaches the rest of the global fleet instantly. A self-driving car in Japan sees something new, analyzes it, whatever it happens to be, you know, whatever it is, instantly communicates that information and that learning to the rest of the connected car fleet. Hive minds. We also have, we've also managed to connect two rats on different continents where one rat learned how to do a maze, then plugged in the other rat, literally, uh, and that rat knew how to do the maze instantly. So hive minds. Are your children basically prepared for hive minds? What they mean, how you use them, basically why they're good or beneficial, why they're bad and horrible, points of view. So this particular chart, and all of these different technologies are explained in the codices uh, on, the, uh, the, on the website. And uh, there's QR codes, so if you want to understand more about, for example, nanomedicine, scan the QR code, it takes you to all the articles and things, basically, on, uh, on my blog. Now, how many of you believe in magic? So this is where I go a little bit further into the future. How many of you believe in magic? Excellent. Yeah, excellent. Are you a magician, sir? <laughs> That's it. Um, one of the reasons, basically, why we don't necessarily believe in magic as much as we used to is because we're educated. How many of you, when you walked into this room, looked at the lights and thought, wow, what the heck is that? Never seen one of those, but that's amazing. What's this thing? What's this beaming sun in the room? And I said, well, it's an artificial light. If you went back 100 years ago, 200 years ago, and I showed you that, let alone, basically, the amazing world of clickers and laser pointers, um, like that, you know, that's magic. Magic is increasingly something that we just think of as it's technology and it's a trick that we don't know how it's done. So what I want to do is just to demonstrate that everything that you think of as science fact, everything that you think of as science fact or science fiction is now becoming science fact. We'll walk through some things. Who likes science fiction? I mean, the good news and the bad news is I'm going to show you some of the science fiction things, um, but they're also science fact. Technically, science fiction is dead because the researchers in the labs killed it. Um, so you can go and write letters to them if you like. Um, so deflector shields. Do you want to know how, to make, how you make a deflector shield? This is courtesy of British Aerospace. Any hands up? Yes, we know. Okay, great. If you want to make a deflector shield, you fire a laser at the upper atmosphere and you create something called a Fermi lens effect. That deflects lasers. That's courtesy of British Aerospace. Holograms. How many of you have actually witnessed and seen a genuine hologram? Proper hologram. Not a fake thing. Proper hologram. Okay. One. This is the world's first. So in all these massive adverts that you see, for example, in Blade Runner, these massive holograms. This is the world's first Free air, 3D, living hologram. Hologram. That is not using augmented reality. We are not using fake bit tricks. We're not using glass. This is the real deal. And you can thank physicists for this. Uh, if you want to know how, we, how it's done, uh, I'm not part of the magic circle, so I can tell you. Um, we are using femtolasers and nanocellulose. 
So we suspend, we use lasers to suspend nanocellulose by seeing the air and move it around and everything else, and then we shine a laser light on it. Today this thing is this big, tomorrow it's this big, then it's this big, then it's this big, and then the technology starts miniaturizing, then it starts commercializing, and then at some point you buy these out of PC World or Amazon. Molecular assemblers. At the start of last year, we created miniature DNA robots, but also miniature molecular robots. Put them into a line. These are the molecular robots. Put the molecular robots into a miniature production line. Got them to make, mo you know, got them to make molecules. In, in the 1960s, we were told basically you couldn't make a molecular assembler. But isn't the human body a molecular assembler? So if you want to go and build one of these, by the way, go and have a look at the Arvix and all that kind of stuff. So molecular assemblers, generation 0.001, but fast forward 20 years. British Aerospace, for example, uh, actually want to use these to grow drones. So you just press a magic button and go, grow me a drone. Um, we're already using some relatives of molecular assemblers to help us assemble complex drugs. And that's thanks again, basically, to, for example, a chem, 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 chem computer from the University of Glasgow. Neural streaming. How many of you would like, basically, to be, would like to be able to stream the thoughts of your children to YouTube? I know, I know you would, wouldn't you? I mean, some would actually argue that it's Instagram, for a start. Um, but how about this one? What if I had a technology that could stream your thoughts directly to the wonderful world of YouTube. Amazing, amazing. So what we have here is we have volunteers who are looking at these geometric shapes on the left. And this is what's being screened to a TV. Now, if I asked you what shapes, if I covered this side up and I asked you what shapes are being shown over here, you'd probably get some of them right. On the other hand, because, let's face it, you're probably, a, you're probably critics, um, you'd say, yeah, it's not very clear. It's not exactly sort of high definition, basically, like my, uh, like my, uh, like my TV, and whew, I'd get a headache watching that. Three years ago, we didn't have the technology to do this. In another three years, these will be much, much clearer. We can actually already do this with movies, where you can see a, a person watching an elephant movie or a documentary, for example, and the elephants are walking across the screen and parrots are flying in the air. How we're doing this is we're using a skull cap combined with artificial intelligence to live stream information from billions of neurons in real time. And we're using that technology in, for example, the UK NHS, as well as other sort of uh, health services, uh, because if you have a locked-in syndrome patient, you put a skull cap on, they can start communicating with loved ones. We also are starting to use that same technology, again, the US are doing that, to control fighter jet fleets. The U.S. like their, like their military. Um, telepathy. How many of you have played uh, Tetris? Yeah. Excellent. Uh, hopefully, hopefully you're not playing it now. No? Watching? Good. Um, so, how many of you have played Tetris on a glass screen? I don't know how you played Tetris if you didn't play it on a glass screen, frankly. Um, so last year, we managed to get three people hooked into a something called a telepathic internet to play Tetris telepathically. Literally as it sounds. They did also use a glass screen because you have to be able to see what you're doing. Um, so again, the interesting thing about this is we used something called TMS devices, again, combined with artificial intelligence. But if you had millions of TMS devices, and these things just sort of go along the side of the head, you have a telepathic communication that operates at internet scale. Now, who would like to name one of their favorite social media companies? Begins with an F. Who, who knows who I'm talking about? Who is it? Yes. That's it. No one else starts with an F. So that was an easy question for you guys. Facebook are trying to create the world's first telepathic internet. And Mark Zuckerberg has gone on record saying that he wants Facebook to be the world's telepathic social network. You can just imagine the regulators now, can't you? Going... So we can email via WhatsApp. Um, is that encrypted? And then you're doing this telepathic thing as well. Um, is that safe? Oh, yes, it absolutely is. Yeah, it's great. Oh, okay then. Just checking. Um, tractor beams. How many people love tractor beams in science fiction movies? Is it your favorite, is it your favorite technology? No, nah, tractor beams. Well, here we go. 
Thanks to the University of Bristol, they do have competition from the University of New York, has to be said. But University of Bristol is slamming it to the Americans. This is the world's first tractor beam. What we're doing is we're using ultrasound to move blobs around. So it's good to see that your tax dollars are actually at work. If you go to the University of Bristol and say, what are you doing? And they sort of go, well, we're moving pea-sized uh, blobs around. Um, sounds great. This technology, though, is starting to be commercialized. So here's a good example of how you take two emerging technologies and you transform one industry. So we take tractor beams that allow you to move things around using sound. We combine it with a 3D printer. You now have a 3D printer that allows you to 3D print stuff and then assemble that thing, whatever it happens to be, phone or what have you, in situ. You've just disrupted global manufacturing. This is now on the radar of Foxconn. Foxconn assemble hundreds of millions of phones a year, for example, for Apple and you know, the rest of the gang. So you take two quirky technologies, you combine them together, so you apply human innovation, and now you are on the path to disrupt global manufacturing. Um, however, also consider this. From an organization or a government perspective, you know, most multinationals work in kind of the one to 20 year time frame, depending on who they are, the industry they inhabit and everything else. Um, Governments, educators really try to need, I, I think, generally try to work sort of 20, 50 years out. But consider this. The vast majority of you agreed earlier that the pace of change is accelerating. If the pace of change is accelerating, does your 10-year plan really become a 7-year plan? Does your 5-year plan become a 3-year plan? I'll give you an example. One of the world's largest insurance organizations, 30% of their revenues come from general insurance, auto insurance. You probably use them. I won't mention who they are. They felt, basically, with all their studies, they thought that um, self-driving cars would have an impact, a very, very basic impact, basically, on their general insurance business in 2035. This was in 2017. In 2021, Ford are going to be dropping 1,000 cars into London, We've already got Google dropping thousands of cars into Austin, Texas, and everything else. That insurance company that was working to a timeline of 2035 has now had to change their horizon plan to 2025. They were 10 years out. That general insurance business is worth about six to seven billion pounds. So if everything's accelerating, your 10-year plan is your seven-year plan. But as we continue accelerating, it gets shorter and shorter and shorter. Consider this as well. I mean, you've probably seen loads of these charts. So this is technology adoption, um, both from technology and digital services perspective. It took 75 years for 50 million people to have a telephone. And that's not because basically that's how long you have to wait for British Telecom to come around and install your phone, by the way. Um, Pokemon Go hit 50 million users in 19 days. So as we look at this, as we get more people connected, as we increasingly move into the digital world, at what point do you see a multi-billion dollar business built in a day? You've still got to build the products and then you've got to launch them, obviously. But at what point do you see a multi-billion dollar business and or a revolutionary new product or service or thing make a global impact in a day? It's going to be soon. Now... Some of the other things that are lost based on a lot of people basically when we start talking about technology is these technologies, on the one hand, we're digitizing everything. That increases the speed of change. We are decentralizing everything. We are democratizing everything. So from a democratization perspective, if you want access to the world's most powerful artificial intelligence, something like Google TensorFlow, go and download it. Go to the internet, download it. Congratulations, you now have access to one of the world's most powerful and capable artificial intelligences which you can innovate on top of. They also demonetize things. So giving you an example, this is one of the examples that um, we're actually working on with um, Samsung and Huawei. Should we decentralize healthcare, primary healthcare, and some secondary healthcare? If I look like I'm taking a selfie, these have been developed by students for 50 bucks, by the way. We're not talking mega organizations like GSK or whatever it happens to be. If I look like I'm taking a selfie, what I'm doing is I'm using artificial intelligence and the camera on my phone to identify pancreatic cancer. 
So if I have slightly yellowy eyes and a, and a flush, it's not just because I have stage fright. Um, it's because it might be something up with me. If I use the microphone on the phone combined with artificial intelligence, I can detect the early onset of PTSD, depression, and uh, Alzheimer's and dementia. Because when you get dementia, you start talking slightly differently. AIs, provided they're properly trained, can pick that up, all with a sort of 90 to 95% accuracy. In addition to that, I can use the accelerometer on my phone combined with artificial intelligence, and I can now detect whether I have the onset of early heart, heart disease. Within the space, and I can do a lot more than that, but within the space of... I don't know, what, minute, two minutes, I've given myself a healthcare checkup. If I put that into a CCTV camera as you all walk into the building, we can tell you basically your state of health, as well as your behaviors, your emotional mood, and all that kind of stuff. So all of these technologies decentralize everything. If I, saw, if I asked you 10 years ago to go and sit in a field, and I said, go sit in a field for an hour, um, and I say, at the end of that hour, I want, you to, I want to know what you've done when I came back, you sort of probably go, well, I watched some butterflies uh, and I picked some weeds up. Um, however, um, if I ask you that same question today, you'll go, well, I went online, but I, I, did some edu- I, I educated myself on YouTube, perhaps. I bought a pizza, had it delivered by a drone, did a healthcare checkup, um, also managed my stocks and shares, did some financial stuff, phoned my mate in Australia. Technology decentralizes everything and it demonetizes everything as well. It reduces the individual cost of transactions down to zero. Plus, what happens in one industry has knock-on effects basically with every other industry. And increasingly, as we start feeling that technology is something that's being done to us, more and more people are trying to find a sense of purpose. So creative machines. What if we have creative machines that could innovate new products? What if you could come up with thousands of options for a single design, without drawing, all of which meet specific goals set by the designer? And from those options, pick the one design that delivers on the most important criteria, the design you couldn't possibly have imagined. This is Generative Design, a technology that harnesses massive computing power, creating forms with precise amounts of material only where needed, achieving maximum performance while wasting nothing. But generative design can be about much more than simply turning out alternatives. Prototypes can be scanned and equipped with sensors that provide real-time performance data that can be looped back into the design process so the object, in effect, co-designs itself. And depending on the material and method of manufacture chosen, the software can optimize the design for those choices. The things that have limited us in the past, software, materials, manufacturing, no longer do so. With generative design, the world can look and perform any way we want it to. This is the next stage in the evolution of design, and it's happening now. So as we automate left-brain jobs, we're telling all of our children to move to creative and right-brain thinking. That's it, which is right to do, to be fair. But we've got machines that are now innovating. Those machines basically are now innovating products, basically for NASA, Airbus, Under Armour, and everything else. We're here, iterative. We take a basic product, they iterate on top of it. If I ask you to t- develop a drone, for example, you could probably develop a lightweight drone basically within, say, two weeks to two months, depending on your skill set. These machines basically will take information in from sensors within a product, feed it back to an artificial intelligence, a GAN basically that will then run thousands of simulations a minute to figure out what the best design is to meet your individual criteria. We're teaching children robotics in some schools. So when children come out basically of school in 20 years time and they are the world's best robotic designers, this was two years ago now. This is a sausage robot. The researchers tasked it with moving from one side of the stage to the other or one side of the floor to the other as quickly as possible. It's got sensors in it. As it moves across the floor, sensors feed the information back to a creative machine, a general adversarial network. That GAN understands its instruction and tries to design robot number two. It tests it, it simulates it, and all that kind of stuff. This is a self-evolving robot, and there is a field called evolutionary robotics where we are trying to get robots to merge computer codes and everything else, today, let alone 20 years' time. This is already being used in a variety of different situations as well. So this particular robot goes off, does its walk again, then gets printed off by a 3D printer. 
So today, basically, we have schools clamouring over three access to 3D printers because 3D printers are king. 3D printers are actually already old technology. This particular, uh, this particular robot is printed off. It's assembled by a lab technician. But if you take a 4D printer where 4D is time, and we did this with MIT about three years ago, you end up with a robot basically that can self-evolve, print itself on a 4D printer, and walk off the printer. And what we can print into that robot is increasingly sophisticated. What the machines can design is increasingly sophisticated. So how many of our children are being taught about the concepts, because getting hold of the technology might be difficult, how many are being taught about the concepts of evolutionary robotics? This is the NASA, this is the NASA lunar rover that artificial intelligence designed. It's so efficient. These creative machines are so efficient. This is the main way that NASA now designs anything that's going into space. And NASA, before this uh, came out, went, we have the world's top experts at JPL. Nobody can, can, nobody can innovate these things better than we can. They got beaten, hands down, by creative machines. If you've flown an Airbus A380, if you go onto Under Armour's website, you buy an architect sneaker, there's an architect sneaker for 300 bucks that was designed by an artificial intelligence. But we're accelerating up and out. If you want to create a virtual reality world, the it takes you a long time. That you see until this. rendered by a graphics engine. It's actually rendered by the AI technology that we built. This is the first time we combine machine learning and computer graphics to do image generation using deep networks. This accelerates innovation hundreds of millions of For training data, we are given some driving sequences of different cities. And then we use another segmentation network to extract the high-level semantics from these uh, sequences. We have the UE4 engine to generate these colorized high-level uh, layouts. Different objects were given different colors. The network converts uh, this representation to images. I made uh, my co-author to dance Gangnam Style, <laughs> which uh, I don't think he would do by himself. We find some good dancing videos uh, from another person and then use my model to synthesize the dance move. That was uh, created by machines, it's not me. <laughs> Simulation engines basically are massively under-egged today. If you can create a virtual reality world, you can train an artificial intelligence millions of times faster. If you stick a robot basically into there, so for example, OpenAI recently created the world's most dexterous robot. What they did is they created a robotic, a virtual robotic hand, and they went, put it through 800 men and women years worth of training in two days in these systems. After those two days worth of training, it was the world's most dexterous robotic hand. Simulation environments, virtual reality environments, immersive worlds, whatever you want to call them, accelerate the development of artificial intelligence, a major technology, and robots, another kind of major technology, hundreds of millions of fold today. Amazon are using these devices to train Scout. Most car manufacturers are using these to put their cars through tens of millions of miles, tens of, millions of, miles of testing every day. Everything accelerates from here. We have robo-scientists as well. So our children are going to be, and I have two young children, age five and seven. Our children are going to be up against robo-scientists. Recently, we had an artificial intelligence create the first genome, the first artificial intelligence drug that it designed 30,000 drugs in 21 days and came up with some winners. And recently in Australia, we had an artificial intelligence design the world's first AI vaccine, and that is now headed to human trials. So all of these different technologies basically are coming through today, let alone when our children are ready. If you don't know how to produce a video and you haven't got a camera crew, hey Jake, um, what you can now do is you can now type whatever you want. So create a video of somebody playing golf, somebody swimming, whatever it happens to be. These are GANs from Stanford and Princeton. Uh, this is the old version. The new version is much better. But you literally type. 
And these GANs basically will understand basically what you've typed, what video you're trying to produce, and then it will produce the video. Fast forward, the, two years ago this was, uh, the one that came out a couple of weeks ago um, is much better than that, bigger images, higher quality images, and you start stretching out. Three years ago, you couldn't create that. This is, even the experts in this field are, are sort of concerned at how fast this is moving. We also have artificial intelligences that are designing artificial intelligences better than human experts. We have supercomputers creating neural networks 99% faster than humans. We have AIs that are self-evolving. We've got five. That's a fun, that's a fun area. Uh, Facebook's AI learnt a new language by itself and evolved. Uh, Google's AI learnt how to encrypt its own communications. Um, we have open AI, AI that learnt maths all outside of their programming. So how do you start getting, figuring that one out? AIs also create their own knowledge. However, two years ago, basically, we saw the rise of the world's first fully autonomous companies. Are your children prepared for that? Uh, we have ADA, which is a hedge fund, basically, out of uh, Hong Kong uh, that is a fully autonomous company, and we have other autonomous companies now on Wall Street and in the US. So... Every single industry, every single industry is being disrupted, and I'm going to race through these. Aerospace, electric aircraft. We have flying taxis now basically coming through in Singapore, being tested in the UK, being used in Dubai. Aircraft and flying taxis merge at some point in about the next five to seven years. Um, increasing access to space. Uh, I work with a variety of space organizations the cost of accessing space has dropped by a hundredfold, and we can now access space every day. We've got new launch systems coming through that make accessing space as easy as, as getting on a commercial airliner. Space tourism. The ISS has been opened up as, an, as a space hotel. We are now have people talking about space hotels in 2023, and those are already launching. Space is a massive industry moving forward. Autonomous space factories, we have companies like Space Tango that are now launching autonomous space factories. They're fully automated, robotic space factories. They produce whatever they produce, bring it back down to earth. Agriculture. This is how we solve global famine. We are making history right now. This is fish, but you can do this for meat and all sorts of other At things Finless Foods, well. we're taking the first step into creating a world where everyone has access to fresh, healthy, delicious, and sustainable seafood. We're proud to announce the world's first clean fish ever to be eaten. This means fish produced entirely without cruelty, not just dolphin safe, but fish safe as well. All right, you, you ready? Yeah. Yeah. There you go. Fish is known as one of the most healthy sources of protein on the planet, and we're eating more and more of it every day. Up to 90% of the world's fisheries are overexploited or depleted. Contaminants like mercury, plastic, growth hormones, and antibiotics are increasingly making their way into our favorite foods. We knew there had to be a way to produce seafood without causing the harm that it does now. We're looking at the biochemical process that happens inside of a fish and making it happen outside of a fish in order to produce the same seafood that people love to eat. What they've done is they've started with nothing and they've built themselves a whole technological platform to make food in a way that just hasn't been done before. Seeing that come to fruition today was an extremely moving experience for me and I think also an important one uh, in terms of how human beings eat. Why would you choose to farm or fish wild fish with all that environmental and human health cost when you could just have it made by Finless Foods? At Finless Foods, we're on a mission to revolutionize the way seafood is made. Fish without the fish, meat without the animal, and it's not plant-based, it's not fake, it's not artificial. You take a stem cell, you put it into a bioreactor, you apply certain natural hormones, and those are expensive at the moment, you now grow steak, meat, duck, tuna, salmon, whatever it happens to be. Again, if you fast forward, if you sort of go back in time about five years ago, clean, this thing called clean meat basically cost about a million dollars a pound. As the technology improves, as our understanding of the technology and how to do this improves, we're now at $363 per pound. And the US FDA is letting this be sold on supermarket shelves in the US. China has just bought $300 million worth of clean meat from Israel because... As we start having a look at future populations, 
we know that there's going to be shortages of food. But what happens to all of the land, basically, when you don't need cows any longer? What happens to land, basically, when you can grow eight crops a year in a vertical farm in the corner of a building? Amazon, and who, if anyone uses Ocado, Ocado have just invested in a vertical farm. If you order lettuce from Ocado in the near future, it will come from their warehouse. It's not coming from an actual UK farm, or a Spanish farm, for that matter. Communications, as I mentioned earlier, we're throwing 12,000 low-Earth orbit satellites up at the moment with SpaceX, Virgin, Qualcomm, and everything else. We are connecting the last 3.5 billion people on the planet. Basically, that increases the amount of competition, but also opportunity for everybody. All you need is one person in that 3.5 billion to be an Elon Musk or a Steve Jobs or a whatever it happens to be. They can change the world at internet scale. Are we teaching children that they can have an idea and they can change the world, like Greta Thunberg, for example, because we can use these connectivity platforms and digital platforms to our advantage. We can change the planet, basically, in ways that we have never imagined before at a speed we've never imagined before. Construction. We are now at the point where we have people living in 3D printed homes. If you are Crowdace, if you are Barrett's, and you are building traditional brick homes like we are in the UK, we can 3D print buildings. Similarly, we can 3D print a building in a day. In South America, we can 3D print an entire community in a day. We can 3D print a livable four-bedroom house for about $20,000. People in France are already living in them. In the west coast of the US, Ukraine, Holland, they're already building this stuff. In Dubai, they want 25% of buildings by 2030 to be 3D printed. They are 3D printing an 80-story skyscraper starting 2021 because you scale this robotics up. We then have artificial intelligences that are designing cities, designing communities, designing buildings basically on the back of this. We have a way to turn construction sites fully autonomous. Energy. I mentioned energy. We have a pathway basically to 80%. So, for example, if you go to IKEA, you buy a commercial solar panel, that's 17% efficient. Uh, if you go over to, say, Dubai, basically you go to a traditional solar farm, wherever it happens to be, we're generating electricity at 0.2 cents per kilowatt hour. We're already almost at zero on the cost of generation. Silicon solar panels basically have got an energy efficiency of 27%. That's their record. Perskovite solar panels are 32%. We have bacterial solar panels where you take bacteria and you put a bacteria into a solar panel. That gets us to 50. You use carbon nanotubes to capture the latent heat within a solar panel. You go to 80. Fossil fuels is dead. And then there's lots of other sort of things going on in the energy space. Entertainment, for example, we already have the rise of virtual bloggers, creative machines. We've already got creative machines that have been signed by Warner Brothers and Sony that produce music. So if your children want to be pop stars in the future, they are up against creative machines. Um, when we have a look at education, the way that we need to educate our children, basically, for this future has to change dramatically. Because you step back two generations and speak to your great-grandparents or grandparents and say, was a job for life? And they sort of go, yeah, kind of. How many people today basically can say they have an actual job for life? Look at LinkedIn. People are moving around jobs every three to five years on the main. You know, in my own world, basically, when I worked at IBM, IBM made 50,000 people redundant because basically they were part of the old world, not the future world. 50,000 people kicked to the curb. I'm going to throw this one in here as well. We have the world's first artificially intelligent teacher. Hi, I'm Will. And I work at Vector helping young people learn about renewable network. energy. Here's what happened when I met some students for the first time. I can help you become an energy expert. What should we start with? Geothermal genius. Magma from the Earth's core comes closer to the surface and we end up with volcanoes, hot springs and geysers. But do you know what magma is? Molten rock from the outer core. Absolutely right. I thought Will was really, like, fantastic. Like he's there looking at us. Like, it's like a real human. Here's a quick question for you. What do you think is the windiest city in the world? Wellington. Nice. If the sun is so far away, how long do you think it takes sunlight to reach us? Ten minutes. Correct. You're a solar superstar. I was curious if they liked me. It's different from, like talking to Will than talking to like Siri for example because like 
He's there, you can, you can see him. He was quite human-like, even though he's an AI. Then, the human version of me arrived. How's it going? Uh, good. Is it cool? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, it was cool. We got some really good reactions out of a few kids. Is that you? Yeah, yeah. That's really cool. Yeah. A couple of them didn't recognise me straight away. You know it's me, eh? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. True, I can see that now. It's a bit of a shock seeing my digital avatar for the first time. It's like looking in the mirror, I guess. Let's face it, he may look like me, but I'm the one who knows about energy. Yeah, I think Will could be used... Uh, as an education tool in many areas. We did learn some things that we didn't know. Wellington is the windiest city. I learned that you wouldn't notice if, su if, if the sun went away for 10 minutes. It's not just a blank screen they're staring at answering questions, so they feel like they're actually interacting with an, a human. He was a good teacher. It was great meeting the thinkers of tomorrow because together we can shape our energy future. So Will has taught 250,000 children in Australia and New Zealand about renewable energy. He is not a bot. He is a neural network. If you ask him different questions, if you talk in a particular way, he reacts essentially with a human brain. Um, however, increasingly, basically, while we have these technologies coming through, we then as educators basically have to ask, where do we use these? You still have to have people. As we face an increasingly machine-driven, machine-centric future, you've got to have people. But how do we balance all of that? Um, from a soft skills perspective, our children have to have, they have to be adaptable, collaborative, but collaborative not just with humans, also with AIs and machines. They've got to be confident. They've got to be creative, even though creative machines basically are starting to try to steal some of their thunder. They've got to be curious. They've got to be entrepreneurial. They've got to think exponentially. So, for example, you go to a, if you go to an adult and say, how do we solve world hunger in 2050? Most people go, well, we need to uh, genetic engineering, more fertilizer, more land, um, special crops. No. Do a bioreactor. Get children thinking in different ways. Children still storytell as well. You know, if you have a look at the past, you know, a lot of knowledge was passed down via around, you know, around a campfire. Today, basically, kids are, taught, are, are telling stories, but they're telling stories on social media. Storytelling is still a massive part of everything. Resourcefulness, leadership, ethics, because you can use these technologies for good and bad. In healthcare, we've got... 3D printed organs, like I mentioned. Basically, we've got designer humans. Basically, we have people in China who are now genetically engineering twins so they don't get HIV. This is today. This is not 20 years' time. These technologies will be much more mature, basically, when the kids are going to go in and try and get a career. We've got robo robot surgeons. Basically, we've got robot surgeons now that can operate over 5G networks. So you could have a building like this with surgeons in the corner and you could be operating on people in Africa. You decentralize healthcare. Paralysis cures. We have cured paralysis in a multiple number of ways, basically using stem cells and carbon nanotubes. Paralysis used to be for life. We've got people in the UK who now walk because of some of the new technologies that we have coming through. Inherited conditions, like the one I described, in vivo gene editing, if you're born with an inherited genetic disease, we can see the beginning, basically, where that is no longer the end for you. Breathe in the cure. We have aerosol mRNA, basically, so cystic fibrosis sufferers. Eventually, they will be able to have a nebulizer. This is from the US. And you breathe in. And you have a gene editing tool, basically, in an aerosol, which is both good for a cystic fibrosis sufferer because it helps them. Um, but it's also bad because you could just simply do that at the front of a stage, basically, and all of a sudden you're breathing in whatever gene edited thing, basically, I've just designed. Um, Biocomputer, we have already demonstrated you can turn mammalian cells and human liver cells basically into computers that will identify biomarkers in your body and then manufacture the corresponding medicine or drug to treat whatever it is that you have. And then we have these. I mentioned earlier basically nanobots. So we use magnetism. And then these nanobots go around a maze and everything else. Um, we've got nanobots that can drill into cells and kill cancerous cells, basically already coming out today. And they kind of keep doing that, so I'll skip forward. But these are the future surgeons. Retail. We have, we're using 3D printing in retail, as I mentioned earlier, for example, with Adidas. 
uh, and Nike, basically where you go into a store, you design your product in store, it prints off in the back. That has a whole variety of ramifications. Um, so that was a... Uh, who wants to see that one? That wasn't, that's, this is a Miami designer. So high-end fashion. These are 3D printed clothes. If you're running London Fashion School or something like that, basically you're starting to get people into this. But if you have a creative machine that can design a dress, and then you have a 3D printer that can print it off, and you have an augmented reality system or a body camera system that can take your precise measurements, you never ever have to wear an ill-fitting set of clothes again. And then you can recycle these. You can break them down, reprint them. This does not look like 3D printed fashion. But this technology is accelerating. Amazon, if you use Amazon, Amazon now has all the pieces of the jigsaw puzzle that become the world's first fully autonomous retailer. They have a machine that designs clothes, they have a machine that makes clothes on demand, basically then they have machines that pick pr clothes and products basically on demand, and then they have autonomous fleets, uh, autonomous transportation fleets basically that are coming. Or Amazon have all the bits of the jigsaw puzzle they need to disrupt retail, particularly sort of standard fabric-based retail, homewares and that sort of stuff, all over again. And then transportation, we are going self-driving cars. Kids basically might not actually need licenses, We've got wirelessly charged EVs coming through and everything else, but 2024, and this is the last one, 2024, this has been flight tested 70 times. And uh, again, bearing in mind that 2024 is what? Five years-ish out, not 20. How would you like to live in London and then commute to Sydney every day? So when you think the pace of change is accelerating, it is. Everything is being disrupted. When you have a look at it from your own individual viewpoint, your organization's viewpoint, when you have a look at it, let alone basically from my children's viewpoint or your children's viewpoint or your grandchildren's viewpoints, everything's accelerating. The way that we are teaching them today basically will give them a whole variety of skills that they do need and that are valuable in the future, but there are a lot of things that we need to augment those teachings with. So my name is Matthew Griffin. I thank you basically for sitting through what hopefully you thought basically was an interesting presentation as I showed you pretty much the single grain of sand in the desert. This is the top of the iceberg. There is a lot more than this. And um, yeah, thank you very much for coming. <laughs>